Hello, good afternoon everybody. Um, this is Martina McPherson. I'm delighted to present the next edition of the FCG webinar series hosted by Bright Talk and NSFM NextGen. Today we're discussing natural capital, species extinction and sustainable finance, the impact of SDGs. I'm not saying too much about myself. Um, I'm actually the president of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets. I wear multiple hats across industry and academia. I've worked extensively on multiple ESG and sustainable finance topics when it comes to investing, when it comes to indexing, when it comes to public policy. Um, I just would like to focus a bit more going forward now on the work that we are undertaking here as part of today's panel discussion and hence straight away allude to the agenda. We are a fully packed panel today. We have fantastic speakers across industry and academia. We are talking around a bit more than 60 minutes today and ultimately following these opening remarks here we will have two keynotes by Jill Atkins, University of Sheffield, um, and Mark Goch from the National Capital Coalition, followed by a panel debate um, where we literally evaluate the framework for natural capital and species extinction, as well as engagement solutions. And I'm delighted to have Marty McBride from CBSB, Paul Dionellas from WWF, Andrew Jones from Mazars and the IRC, and Gemma James from the PRI with me. Um, we are then going into a panel debate. We are inviting the public, you all as our audience, to join in for the discussion. To do that, um, unfortunately we can't connect you by audio, so please use the screen. You can actually provide your questions by utilizing the box on the right hand side. Uh, you will also find further information, attachments and links, especially a conceptual paper on the species extinction accounting framework that Jill will be highlighting by clicking on the attachment and links again on the right hand side. And following the Q&A debate, we are having a couple of minutes of closing remarks and then we are aiming to close probably the session by 10 minutes past 5 p.m. BST today. Um, without further ado, I'd like quickly to just highlight the aim and the purpose of the, the SDG webinar series. So we are hosting um, throughout the course of 2019 a series of SDG linked webinars that will provide actually an insight into ESNG matters when it comes to research, when it comes to best practices, um, and ultimately we are inviting leading experts across industry and academia um, from various markets, asset classes, then the entire investment value chain to discuss these topical issues. Um, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals are really serving us as a leading framework for the sustainability issues we are debating. They serve as our roadmap to identify, classify, measure and benchmark key issues. Today's discussion will be predominantly linked back to the SDG 14 and 15, that's life on the water and on land, and we will literally reflect on natural capital, biodiversity, um, natural habitat and of course species and this is actually part of the SDG series. As you can see, and high, uh, highlights will come in a moment by Jill, we are actually facing a massive crisis. It's the sixth period of mass extinction with massive impact for flora and fauna, which ultimately will have a lasting impact uh, on our economic as well as our financial system. And this webinar here will or aims to provide more clarity when it comes to leading academics and industry experts debating natural capital and species extinction issues. We hope you will also better understand the risk management and accounting framework that can be utilized for natural capital preservation and species extinction issues. And last but not least, we hope as well to provide you with some prompters at least that link back to suitable capital markets and investment products and services to address the issues. And this is an important point here I would also like to flag in May we had in this, the, today actually we had a species extinction natural capital and sustainable finance event at Investec Bank. So some of our panel speakers here will refer to some of the points that have been made during the discussion where we looked again more higher level at some of the key issues, some of the projects when it comes to nature preservation, some of the frameworks and taxonomies that are being utilized and of course some of the products and solutions that have already been developed in the sustainable finance domain. And before I'm handing over to Jill, just to highlight as well, um, the NSFM Next Gen Network is a very interactive network here of academics and industry professionals that really aims to drive discussions around sustainable finance, 
banking and insurance, and we hope you can engage with us uh, via actually our current social media link here, nsfmnextgen.org. We are currently in the process of developing a website, and all of this valuable content that we are creating will ultimately be interlinked via Bright Talk, via NSFM, and other parties that we are collaborating with. Again, thank you very much for attending this session, and I'm handing over to Jill. Hello, everybody. I am very happy to talk to you today, following our event this morning, which I think produced a lot of potential solutions. You can't hear me. Okay. Okay. So um, the planet, as Martina has already said, is currently experiencing a mass extinction event, with human and business activity being the root cause of species loss and habitat destruction. Handing over to a sample of almost half vertebrate species, 32% are decreasing in population size and range, and as a result of habitat loss, over-exploitation, invasion by alien species, pollution, and global warming. As well as species going extinct, populations of species are diminishing and disappearing. This is the reason giraffes. Giraffes are now on the endangered list, with 40% of the population lost over the last 40 years. Given the extinction crisis that we currently find ourselves in, making connections between species extinction and our global capitalist system is crucial to driving conservation and species protection. By identifying species loss and extinction as a financially material risk pervasive across all aspects of business, finance and accounting, we also identify an urgent need for action for developing and implementing a species protection action plan which can be spread out across the financial sector throughout all elements and levels of the capital markets, their structures, mechanisms and institutions. Given this looming environmental disaster, the accounting and business community cannot simply assume that a scientific solution will be found to prevent extinction and the associated risks which it poses to humanity. In our recent book, Around the World in 80 Species, the focus is on investigating avenues in terms of integrating species protection into the heart of business, finance and accounting, and the research has led to the development of an extinction accounting framework for corporate reporting, as well as an extinction engagement framework for responsible investment. In terms of finding um, examples of financial materiality, B decline finance and accounting are primary. B decline provides an easily communicable example of how species loss can affect and is affecting the value chain, businesses, finance and investment. The latest scientific and economic based research provides staggering figures relating to the value of pollination services provided by bees. The recent report produced by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services stated that the value of agricultural crop production, $2.6 trillion in 2016, has increased approximately threefold since 1970, but also asserts that between $235 billion and $577 billion in annual global crop output is at risk as a result of pollinator loss. Estimates of the impact of pollinator decline globally average around £130 billion pounds per year. Bee populations are declining globally due to lack of floral biodiversity, pesticide use, habitat degradation and reduction, mono-agriculture and global warming. Another example which helps us to see material financial risks through the interconnectedness of species is that of durian an exotic fruit which provides a salient example of potential loss of value arising from species loss as well as of the critical balance of interrelationships that necessitate the healthy functioning of ecosystems and the provision of ecosystem services. The fruit is farmed primarily in Indonesia, Thailand and Malaysia. A recent article in The Guardian featured um, how the durian, a foul-smelling fruit, could make millions for Malaysia. China is the world's largest importer of durian with imports of around 292 million kilograms in 2016 and a share of up to 80% of global imports with an anticipated growth of up to 15% in future years. 
Global durian consumption has recently been valued at $14 billion annually, and it is growing rapidly. However, the rush to develop uh, more and more durian plantations is not only threatening endangered jungle species, such as the Malay tiger, elephants, monkeys and birds, but also is leading to decline in fruit bats, also known as flying foxes, and other critically important pollinator species. The future survival of the durian tree is considered to be threatened by the decline in flying foxes. A recent study showed evidence that giant fruit bats are very active and effective in pollinating durian trees. They are already classified as endangered on the red list and are threatened by deforestation and habitat loss, as well as by hunting as bushmeat and being killed as potential pests. The research highlights the critical nature of interrelationships between species of flora and fauna, habitat and human focused ecosystems. This is a material financial risk to business arising from species decline and potential extinction that should be incorporated into any business model. An approach to fruit production that fails to incorporate these ecological risks ensures only a short-term and unsustainable possibility that will result over in the medium to long term in a collapse in the business with no fruit and no forest. There have been numerous attempts to estimate the value of ecosystem services, which includes provisioning services, regulatory supporting and cultural services. Ecosystem services worldwide were estimated to be annually worth $33 trillion, and that's some time ago, much more significant now. Such valuing of global ecosystem services is clearly immensely complicated, as can at best only result in a very rough estimate. Research concludes that changes in global land use between 1997 and 2011 have resulted in a loss of ecosystem services of between $4.3 and $20.2 trillion per year. The authors further estimated total global ecosystem services in 2011 to be $125 trillion per year or $145 trillion per year. These figures are eye-wateringly huge and lead us to think about the um, cost of losing species in the ecosystem and that connection with the financial market. This brings me on to the final um, slide for myself, which is looking at the extinction accounting framework for disclosure on species protection. Current treatments of extinction within reporting frameworks and the GRI principles do go some way towards dealing with biodiversity loss. However, they are not generally emancipatory or transformational. They could result solely in a fossil record of species, merely reporting on species extinctions in habitats under the control of organisations on an annual basis. We therefore propose a disclosure reporting framework, as you can see here, that seeks to incorporate species protection and extinction prevention in a more emancipatory manner. As a final comment, the emancipatory nature of this framework cannot be overemphasised. Environmental, ecological or biodiversity reporting that simply underlines the status quo and ensures business as usual is quite literally a waste of time in a situation of urgency given the rate and speed of species loss. So I'm going to finish there and then pass on to... Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mark Goff. I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Capital Coalition, and I need to... Okay, got it. Thank you. So, my name is Mark Goff. I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Capital Coalition. The coalition was formed by a group of organisations that came together um, back in 2012 at the Rio Plus 20. Um, and the reason it was formed was because there were lots of different initiatives going on at the time. And as we've just heard, we are facing an extinction at the moment which is going to have massive effects, not just on species, but also on the way that we live our lives. I think one of the things that is very clear to me is that when we start looking at one particular issue, we often don't connect it up to other things. And although with the climate agenda at the moment, we're looking very closely at climate change, 
I'm not as worried about the high level impact events around flooding, etc. It's what that will lead to in the way of social deconstruction, in the way that this will affect people, that will ultimately end up making this ten times worse. The Natural Capital Coalition, as I said, came together originally with about 40 organizations. It's now over 300 organizations all around the world, in most of the countries, that are looking at using a way of thinking about nature and our relationship with it to get it into decision making. And if we can inform those decisions that we're making with that relationship included within it, then we will get to a point, hopefully, where we cannot ignore this species extinction that we're going through at the moment. There are lots of benefits to thinking about the world and thinking about our relationship to nature in, in such a way, but natural capital is a metaphor. We're not here talking about something which is fungible, which is tradable necessarily in the same way. We're talking about thinking about our relationship with nature in the same way that we think about financial capital. Something that if we invest in it, we will get returns. So there is an agreement brought together by all of these organizations around the world that are thinking about natural capital, about what natural capital is. This de definition has been through lots of consultation. You may see slight variations of it around the world, but on the whole, it all comes down to this one simple thing that we're talking about here. Stocks, so that's the natural capital bit, that they may be renewable, they may be non-renewable, of the natural resources, i.e. plants, animals, air, water, soils, minerals. It's how they combine to yield a flow of benefits, so that might be ecosystem services or nature's contribution to people in the way that you've heard about it before, and it's about this flow of benefits to people. So what we're talking about is our relationship with nature. I sit on several boards, and at those board meetings I receive board papers that tell me the reason that we should do something, the financial reasons for doing it. It very rarely includes the value of nature within those discussions and therefore it's invisible. If it's invisible, we ignore it. If we ignore it, we end up making poor decisions which end up then having a negative effect on the natural world. Ultimately, this comes back to bite us. How does this relate to finance then? Well, natural capital, from an entity or a company perspective, is a dependency or an impact that they will have on natural capital. You can either impact the negatively or positively on, on nature, or you can depend upon it. That creates costs um, and benefits for your organization, but it also creates costs and benefits for society. And at the moment, we're not paying the right cost for what we are buying, for what we're doing. We pay it once in the money that we exchange, but then there is other externalities that were picked up by society. We're actually paying for it several times. We're paying for, it in, in, for environmental degradation. We're paying for it in social loss as well. And if we added up all of these costs, we would end up with a very different figure, a true cost maybe, for what we are actually purchasing, for what we're actually spending our money on. From a financial perspective, the financial sector, through the activities it, it undertakes, through banking, through insurance, through investments, then has an indirect impact through those entities into the same circle of activities there. Last year, we came together with the Natural Capital Finance Alliance, um, VBDO, a Dutch investment house, um, UNFFI as well, and, and many others around the world in about 60 countries, to start to look at how we could connect the work going on in finance to a growing wealth of work that was going on in the business sector on natural capital. There is obviously a lot of work that already happens in the finance sector on environmental social governance, or ESG, and that's been happening for some time. But what the natural capital perspective offers is several different ways of looking at that go beyond some of the ESG activities that you may be familiar with. The general approach that's being used at the moment tends to only look at impacts. And as I was already saying, we also need to think about dependency. When we do think about dependency, it becomes a business critical issue that we have to deal with straight away. If you're going to run out of sugar next week and you're a If it's an impact upon the water supply, it can be dealt with through your compliance team, through maybe your sustainability team and others. And maybe it isn't reaching the boardroom table on a Monday morning. It's a thing that goes into the sustainability agenda on a Friday afternoon. 
If it's a dependency, it's business critical. The second thing that's generally used is measurement. We tend to think that measurement is going to help us to manage. It's a very common saying. Actually, I disagree with that. What we really need to do is move beyond just having measurement numbers and understand the context and relevance of it. We need to value it. Valuation is the relative importance and worth of something to us. It can be expressed in monetary terms, but also quantitative or qualitative terms as well. And it's that valuation that means that we act. It also, at the moment, most of the things we do are split into issues, whether it's environment, then social and governance, or whether it's looking at particular aspects of that, so water, carbon and soil. What the capital concept does is allows us to start seeing, really for the first time in a business process, how we can trade off between them. How do you compare apples and apples and make, so, make sure you can understand the social impacts, the natural capital impacts, and how do all of these come together? A really important tool when you start thinking about scenario planning, thinking about future-proofing what you're doing. We make trade-offs anyway. We make them without the knowledge. What we're doing here is bringing in information to help to inform better decisions. I've asked lots of people, would they like better information to inform decisions? I haven't found anyone yet that said, no, I don't want it. What natural capital does is provide that robust, credible information that you can use to get advantage across peers, to come together to find solutions. It's going to help you to be a better business, a better organization, a better financial institution if you use this. Finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit about sustainable finance here and how we're actually using natural capital. And I've got a couple of quick examples. First of all, this is split most of the time between green finance, which is, as we were saying before, the idea of the activities of a financial institution through its banking, investment and insurance practices to actually change those and make them more sustainable. In this box, we have lots of examples that are coming through already, particularly following the guidance that I was mentioning previously. CDC Biodiversaire has been working on a product at the moment, a global biodiversity score, that looks to take the economic activities that are going on and link those through, through to impacts upon nature and comparing those against a pristine environment. If we can do this and start getting scores, you can take your portfolio, score the portfolio against biodiversity loss, and start to make more informed decisions again to be able to help us to make better decisions and to stop this extinction loss. The alternative to this is financing green instead of green finance. This may be more familiar to you as conservation finance. There's some really good examples out there as well, and Piraeus Bank in Greece is one of them. They've been using some of this work to look at a particular lake and bring consistency in the way that they are measuring and valuing both the stocks of nature there and the flows, the ecosystem services that that is providing to local communities and internationally through climate and various other issues. By having consistency, by using this natural capital approach in what they're doing, they're not only helping to engage with stakeholders around the lake about conservation as a tool for stakeholder engagement, but they're also able to bring in more investment to make sure that those activities which are going to be positive for the environment are being invested. This is a really good example of a growing area of work around conservation finance and I think that this would be one that we should start being used as a good example going forward. I'm now going to hand over to Paul from WWS. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Nearnas. I work for WWF UK and I'm the Chief Advisor Wildlife and the Science team there, focused on science and policy around wildlife and species. And I'd like to look in a little bit more depth and talk about now building on what uh, Joe was talking about regarding species extinction and biodiversity loss. In recent weeks, many of you might have seen uh, reports from the IFBES, uh, Global Assessment, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. There's a huge array of information in there around the state of nature, but one of the headlines there was an estimate of over 1 million species threatened with extinction. Um, tens to hundreds of times higher than what we think of as the natural background rate of extinction, which I'll come back to in just a second. Um, within that 1 million species, 
40% of amphibians, a third of corals, a third of all sharks and rays, 10% of insects, etc., etc. Some really grim reading. Looking at the bottom of the slide there, and moving on to a different metric, uh, this time looking at the abundance of species, the Living Planet Index, a measure developed by WWF and ZSL, which is an indicator of species population trends, gathers data from almost 4,000 species, and nearly 17,000 different populations monitored over time, starting with the baseline of 1970. And what you can clearly see there is that over a little more than what's actually my lifetime, um, the average decline across vertebrate groups is almost 60%. And when you drill down even further into that, groups such as freshwater populations to even more worrying declines, 83% estimated over that time period. And looking in a bit more detail at measures around extinction specifically, uh, the IUCN Red List assesses species extinction risk based on set criteria, around species distribution, abundance, threats, etc. And you might be familiar with the IUCN Red List uh, assessment looking at uh, from least concern through endangered, critically endangered, right way through to extinct. Currently there are almost 100,000 species assessed on the IUCN Red List. And of those, more than 27,000 are threatened with extinction. The figure on the left that you can see on the slide there shows cumulative vertebrate species recorded as extinct or extinct in the wild by the IUCN. And just at the bottom of that line there, um, or the figure should I say, is a dashed black line. And that represents the number of extinctions, or the rate of extinctions, should I say, that we would expect as a natural background rate. Extinction is, is a natural process, but not at the levels that we're seeing today. And you can see on that figure this massive upsurge in extinctions, coinciding with the onset of the industrialization in, in, in the West. The figure on the right is a representation of the sampled red list index, another metric looking at um, at how changes in extinction rates within taxonomic groups um, varies as, as, as an average. Um, vertebrate groups have been assessed as long, alongside corals actually. Um, and on the figure there, a red list index value of 1 equates to all the species there being least concerned and not threatened with extinction, whereas 0 implies that all the species in that group are extinct. Um, what we can see again is some rather worrying signs there. We've got amphibians starting from a very low base and declining with time. And we've also got a catastrophic decline uh, for corals, um, particularly associated with the threat of, of climate change and global warming. So we're losing species at virtually unprecedented rates. We heard references earlier from some of the other speakers talking about a sixth extinction crisis and so on. There is undoubtedly a biodiversity crisis, and we are currently on target to miss 80% of our SDG, DBD, IHC targets, and virtually any other measure that we care to look at. And so, what is causing this? And the short answer is, is we are. Um, Overexploitation, guns and fishing nets, uh, tractors, agricultural expansion, and land conversion. On the slide there, I've put climate change in brackets. That's not the little potential impact of it, but in the short term, it's not the key threat driving species extinction. Undoubtedly, in the medium to long term, it, it will be. Or to frame it another way around those drivers, the products that we consume, the supply chains behind them, and the materials we use, how they're sourced, how they're extracted, and how we then might use them to manufacture, are all implicated in the current biodiversity crisis. We are living, to put it another way, in the Anthropocene era. This is the first geological era in which a single species is the prime driver for environmental and climate change. And the figure that you see there in the bottom left of that slide really illustrates this. So some of our socioeconomic indicators, uh, optic, we're looking at uh, various measures around climate and environment going in the other direction. So then looking at a little bit more about uh, how that's impacting people and um, businesses. 
I'm taking some information from the recent IPFES report. Um, we've seen that almost a third of our Earth's land surface, and three quarters of our freshwater resources, are devoted to the production of crops and livestock. Yet, at the same time, 75% of the global crops rely on animal pollination. We heard Jill talking in a bit more detail um, about some of the relationships and reliance dependency that uh, businesses have on animal pollinators. Looking at another system, marine. Uh, a third of marine fish are over harvested, currently being fished to commercial extinction. And at the same time, another 60% are fished at their maximum levels, just on the cusp. And, according to the IFPES report, an estimated two thirds of marine environments are already severely altered, largely as a result of fishing. So I hope that, um, uh, from listening to myself and, and, and other folks, people speaking today, that we don't need to emphasise the message that nature is not just a nice to have, but is in fact a fundamental uh, component of human well-being, supporting livelihood, and underpinning long-term economic development. I did, just before I hand over to one of my colleagues, wanted to dive in a little bit more depth, looking at an example um, of the relationship between uh, agro-industry and nature in Brazil, the Cercado, um, a region in Brazil that perhaps doesn't get as much attention as some in that continent, the largest savanna system in South America, almost 2 million kilometres squared, representing almost 20% of Brazil. It's a major watershed. A number of the uh, South American rivers have uh, a large component of water being sourced from that area. And it's also a high area of endemism, very area, where we have uh, 1,600 species of mammals, birds and reptiles, and 10,000 plants that we know of thus far, which half are found literally nowhere else. It is also um, an emerging frontier for agro-industry, uh, primarily soy and cattle, and deforestation and destruction to the natural native vegetation has been extensive in that region. Unfortunately, the loss of the native Cerrado vegetation um, is causing significant problems. The deep root system associated with that red vegetation maintains the water balance not only in the region but throughout Brazil and is having wide impacts on hydrology in that country and beyond. Science shows us that we are seeing 10% rainfall reduction in that landscape, increased dry seasons, rivers becoming seasonal and so on, and, and for a, an agronaut and, and so we want many rain dependent. We're starting to see decreasing yields and productivity, and with, as a result of that, um, a need to expand the agricultural frontier, leaving degraded and uh, useless land behind. So, I think we can say that clearly there is a biodiversity crisis. We can see the impact that uh, we, people, and the businesses are having, but also the dependencies that we also have. Um, and it's now beholden on us to address these issues and take action. And I will pass over to my colleague, Marty. Great, well thank you. And uh, following on from that staff warning, I think it might be a good idea if I provide some clarity to what's going on in the reporting landscape and the potential solutions and what companies can do to take, take it on forward. So I'll start off um, quickly, a bit about CDSB, so the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. We were set up in 2007 in the absence of an international accounting standard to get climate change at that point in time included into mainstream filing, so it could be yeah. filing, so it could be um, as, as um, financial information, so just connect the two together. Um, we, we chumped along there for a few years and released a framework, um, accepted, and we uh, decided to test our luck, and in 2015 we went out to cover um, environment, or the E of ESG, and natural capital information as part of our, part of our framework. Um, so, so moving on um, quickly from there, we are, um, I just sort of quickly touch on, based on this morning's conversations and sort of the noise I'm starting to hear from the market as I go around, there's, a, sort of, there's many, many framework standards, uh, indicators, I think someone at our fancy has invested this morning, 400 indicators out there around natural capital and biodiversity. 
it, it's all very alarming. And I imagine as a, someone trying to think about putting pen to paper and reporting, this is all quite, my goodness, where do I start? And it can often be seen as a barrier to inaction and not getting started at all. I urge everyone always to think about getting started as an inaction barrier to start, or you pick up your pen before you even think about any of the fabulous products that are out there to help you. They are all very complimentary. But just as an example, um, the International Integrated Reporting Stand at Council pulled together um, a group called the Reporting Dialogue, and they are the largest, most commonly used reporting standards to, to capital markets largely across the world on environmental, natural capital, and social information. And I've just sort of put a little bit of a table there which comes directly from their landscape map, which does demonstrate that you already are collecting some of this information if you are reporting to them. So it's always a really good starting place to go. But just on that, as a, maybe not as kind plug to that, um, there currently there is what we call the Better Alignment Project is going on, and it's just finishing its last round of consultations before it releases a report. But what that is, is all these organisations you see up there but, um, on the slide, and um, the International Accounting Standards Board and FABI, in this case our observers, can't imagine them wanting to align, can you just yet with us? Uh, but we've gone out there, so we'll try to think about how we can align principles, requirements, metrics of all these bodies. So if you're talking to each other and you take one tonne of carbon, it actually doesn't mean the one tonne of carbon on the other side. So if you're collecting it for your GRI report, it can easily go in your CDP responsible, your CDP responsible, you know, be used for internal purposes. So sort of to uh, make it a bit more efficient. And we're launching the first founder phase of alignment takes place against the task force on climate related financial disclosure recommendations and will be launched at the Secretary General Summit in September. And the second phase of the broader alignment across uh, all the frameworks and standards takes place over say, six to eight months after that. We're currently scoping a longer term work program, and I can quite confidently tell you, and I think that was also reinforced by what we've purchased here now, but also this morning, uh, we're going to look at alignment of language, so taxonomy language across the, across the piece, because that's just really confusing too. Uh, yeah, and I apologise up front because I am a standard setter and I'm part of that. Um, but we can fix it, and I'm quite confident that we can. So I've got there's quite a few diagrams today. I'm talking by diagrams, just to try and get everyone a bit engaged to see how this works in practice. Yeah. So, so CDSB framework, where does it fit? But where do all the other standards and frameworks fit? Um, and so I've sort of positioned here by looking at from a systems perspective. So, so you kind of know what you're reporting. So at the end, you're doing your integration report or your annual report. You've kind of got structure, structure to capture your data. You've got standards to collect and report and think about your data again. You've got standards out there like that. We talk about materiality. You can't even what's material. They've, they've gone out there for every sector in the world and done the hard work for you. You might as well look at it to start off with and see if it fits you or it does not fit you. You know, like, always good to know. They won't be exactly right, but it's a good place to go. And you've got organisations like Harbour Tracker, Planet Tracker, and all their emerging water work that, that identify the particular issues for you. But, but I, I just want to you know, caveat all of what's going on in the reporting space with very sort of clear message is that you know if you're a public company reporting a private company at the moment you are actually required to report your risk by law to your regulator and your and um, your investors and and with that in mind you just require that to international accounting standards all these other tools just help you do that they're not there to be a bit burden they're there to actually help you make your compliance work a bit easier to help you put consistent comparable information on these emerging these sort of new issues that our people aren't necessarily trained in confidence into your reporting to the market. Very trained and great. Well, thank you, Aisha. You know, just to help with that, there are a few things out there. CDSB, for example, does a lot of work trying to interpret international accounting standards for these sort of new ways. We published a report a few years ago called Enchanted Waters, which looks at IFRS 7 and 9, the sort of brand impairment and how we can apply that to stranded assets, for example. We have a whole program of work that's going on, um, starting in July going forward, looking at that against the task of and climate related financial disclosure recommendations. And I'll also just quickly say that the Australian Accounting and Audit Standards Board has both released some brilliant guidance in this space as well, which really does just talk you through it. So there's, there's, there's some emerging figures out there. I'm not expecting the uh, International Accounting Standards Board and IFRS to slip over tomorrow when I don't think we're going to need these signals to say that there's you know, anything fabulous changing on the horizon. That means that CSV doesn't need to exist anytime soon. You know, 10 years away, maybe, we'll, uh, we can all then you know, do something else. Or, or let's think about it in perspective. Actually, this stuff will just be mainstream and part of corporate reporting. It actually, you won't need to be calling it ESG reporting. It'll, be just, it'll just be corporate reporting. With, and uh, I think that would be welcome as well for decisions for everyone. So just as a bit of an example of ours, you know, I love diagrams, but just help you think because I can't look at you just if you know what to, if you make, if I'm making any sense to you. Another example, linking Mark's natural capital protocol with the CDSB framework, using the, using the tools you already have internally to help with your measurements of the protocol, 
and then plugging that directly into integrates or mainstream reports. You know, it's almost, it's almost as a linear. I think it almost is a nice linear chain. These things all do plug together uh, really nicely and help you take what you are doing, all the good value you're actually doing internally, and actually turning it out to the market in a way they can use it with the same rigor, with the same boundaries. And also with the same proportionality, and I do urge proportionality into your, your mainstream report. You, wouldn't, you don't write 250 pages on climate and find on uh, your financial risk, do you? And you connect it up to your business and strategy. And I have recently been quoted, so I can say it here publicly. The next time that someone uh, tells me they've produced a 50-page TCFD report, I'm going to throw it back at them. <laughs> because that's not the purpose of TCFD, is to incorporate it into your governance, your strategy, your risk, and as part of your business. Um, and you know we don't want to start to see 50 page cyber reports coming out and then another on top of that. This is all supposed to be within the mix and if you need, if you need to produce more information, you know, you've got a very good other places where you can send a breadcrumb trial for that. That's not material to support your material, material decisions. Um, so uh, quickly, oh, I'll get go back. I talk quick but um, I can't go that quickly. So the CDSB framework I've mentioned earlier uh, we have it there to help you report principles of, uh, sorry, support the information to capital markets with the same rigour as financial information. If you take a look at the principles and requirements on the screen now, there's two things they will look like. One, you will find that the language is very similar to international accounting standards. That's deliberate. CDSB sounds a lot like IASB. Uh, you used to have a brand that looks very alike, however we realise that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, clock wasn't moving quite fast enough for some of these issues and it was okay to be a bit more bold and uh, shifted our brand accordingly. So all the other thing these, these uh, principles and requirements look exceedingly like is the task force and climate related financial disclosures recommendations. We'd say our framework is TCSE plus because we cover assurance and when the task force went out to write its recommendations, fortunately it took Wisely, I can say this, the best products in the market and use them to turn out their recommendation and thus there is uh, there was only actually three words different between their principles and requirements and ours and then there was a requirement for scenario analysis on top of that. So uh, our framework now is word for word lined with the TCSD and we're incorporating scenarios in but if you look at our framework it gives you some more guidance than, which you don't get from the recommendation. So it's more of a helpful tool. The other thing is it does, it goes out detailed lines some forest the water cover already and helps you include that into your financial reporting. Um, so where this is, is, is kind of a bit cool at the moment is that, um, particularly if you're based here in Europe, but because this is a webinar, you can also join in in the future, CDSB have just recently received a grant from the European Union, which is very kind of them, if you're listening in, uh, to help us roll this out and help companies do this across climate, so in line with the TCFG, and the European Non-Financial Reporting Directive requirements on water, land use, chase, biodiversity and forest. There will be detailed guidance, on the ground training, webinars, loads and loads of stuff, all freely available, including online training courses, where you can sit down for 45 minutes online and have an account, all accounting body globally accredited, CPD accredited course, you can do these free online on all of these things. So they'll start emerging out over the next, so we've got a back to school launch in September, which is sort of and climate, and then after that the others will follow out as we do the guidance. So it's quite an exciting time, so the online world is where it's all kind of going to happen, and you can tell us around there, doesn't matter where you are in the world, all your level of knowledge is entry points for everyone. And like I was saying, there's entry points for everyone. This morning we heard, and, and Mark touched on it a bit earlier as well, the question keeps getting asked, what can we learn from climate? We've done a lot of our hard work already in this space. We've done a lot of the thinking that can be applied to anything across the EES. And you know, the parts of G that are covered by other requirements as well. Recently we launched a particular checklist you can see on the screen with our, uh, one of our board members and good friends, that's the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board. And this is really just to help people get started with the task of climate risk financial disclosure recommendations compliance. Now, often people have never even heard of that thing and don't know where to start, and they're trying to talk up, up to the risk team. You know, they're in CSR, they've got an idea, or the article, or they've got an idea, or they've got the bandwagon, but what do we do? And it helps sort of bring people together around layman's terms ideas to get started. But let's not think about that from a CCFD perspective. You can actually substitute the word climate in there. Uh, sorry, the word, where the word climate is, substitute that with water, biodiversity, forest, a particular issue you have in your business, even a social issue. And you can start to think about it with that lens. And you know, you don't need to secure the support of your board of directors and executive leadership team. I mean, that could be on any issue. So it just gives you a few helpful pointers about how to get started if you are thinking about reporting. Even in five years, three years, four years, the support you start to get your internal controls in place, get the information collected in a way that it can be useful, that has the right boundaries, it can be set up, it speaks to the right parts of the business. Um, 
And I urge you all now, you know, to get on this journey now because this stuff is going, you know, particularly climate is heading towards regulation quicker than quicker than you can actually probably get the scenarios in life to go. So I urge you now to act because the cost of inaction will just be bigger for your business as you have to play catch up. Um, and I guess the other piece of this is TDSB over the next few months decided to explore its uh, evolution into social issues. So that's taking moving into the S of ESG and how we could potentially support uh, the inclusion of that information in mainstream filings in the future. So with that, if you have any, if you're looking for any further information, I suggest you look at the TCFD Knowledge Hub, which seems to be powering our spare time, which has loads and loads of resources on there and how you can look at um, reporting non-financial information like climate, water, forest, biodiversity into mainstream reports. And remember what I said about learning what we've done from climate. Substituting that word across often can be really helpful. And scenarios, just think about scenarios for anything. You don't need to just apply it to one, two, and four degrees. You can apply it to a change in water use. You can apply it to anything. You know, risk managers and business are uh, risk, business are still in in business business is still alive because they manage risk once. You've got people that know how to manage risk in your business. Go and talk to them, they might have some ideas. And with that, I'll pass over. And I'm just gonna skip forward over all slides again so we can hear from Andrew. <laughs> One second. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, you're all working the slides, but it's good to hear. <laughs> Right, so as you said on the intro slide, I'm an accountant and I'm a financial analyst. And my particular area is non-financial reporting and narrative reporting and integrating that um, non-financial reporting. That being an accountant for, for well, a good number of years, on what count, um, has uh, helped me tie that in to, to non-financial um, reporting. And one of, one of my areas, particularly of myself, is to look at how we can deliver the rigour of the accounting systems, and we haven't finished there yet. The ISB and the um, and the FASB are still going on improving accounting, but how we can apply that rigour to non-financial reporting and narrative reporting. So I'm an accountant. I measure things. I don't just measure numbers. There's qualitative reporting in there as well. Can we chop forward a slide, please, Ryan? Yep. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, a diagram from the Integrated Reporting Council's um, uh, deck. It's about the Integrated Reporting Framework. And what we're saying here is the Integrated Reporting Model is supposed to be about value creation for the business as a whole. What the business does to create value, and value isn't just financial value. To create that value, you need inputs, uh, what Mark called dependencies earlier in his talk, and you create outputs. And the outputs you're aiming to create, uh, the products for customers, the money for employees, better trained employees, better intellectual frameworks, understanding how your business works. Some of those feed back in the loop. Some of the outputs you create are not ones you particularly intend to create, some of them are negative. Not so good, be honest about them. Don't try and hide it under a carpet. The, the Great, some of them are negative. Great, well, thank you. Not just for integrated reporting in the UK, in the strategic report, in other countries, non-financial reports of various sorts ask you to be honest about it, ask you to be neutral, neutral to people about the negatives as well as the positives. Some of those, there's a clear loop which runs right round Durian, as Jill mentioned. <laughs> Your fruit bats probably flying around that row of arrows at the top, or not when they die off instead. If we're running this model, we've got to manage it in that way as well. I think that kind of ties back into what Mark was saying earlier. So we, we don't just have integrated reporting, we have integrated thinking to deliver that integrated reporting. And that's about links between those capitals, understanding the links between those capitals. If you want to say something about diversity or about climate change, you've got to tie it back into your operating model. You've got to understand why it is it's important to your business, otherwise what you produce is likely to look like greenwash. Indeed, probably will be. So why is it affecting your business? How does it affect your employees, your brand, your intellectual capital? And it's quite possible to, to do that in a number of areas. You don't necessarily directly impact um, biodiversity, but maybe your supply chain does. 
maybe you want to contribute to that, but you need to contribute in a way that's tied into your brand. We were speaking at Investec this morning, they tie um, rhino conservation back to their African heritage. That is linked into their brand. If they decided to preserve the life of reed warblers, it would be more difficult to tie in. Apologies, I don't know whether reed warblers are nearly extinct or not, but I, I doubt it. So, linking things together. This, this creature, by the way, this, this um, diagram at the ARC, we, we fondly call the octopus. Now, someone will remind me that octopi have eight legs. Well, if you're actually producing a report, as Marty was saying, you don't want hundreds and hundreds of pages on everything. It produces an unusable report. So you need to trim a few legs off this octopus and get it back to its normal octopodal state. Probably rather less than that, actually. So report on the areas that really are important to your business that can be tied in. Don't try and produce a report on everything. Uh, let's have another slide, please. So focus on what you do to create value. Focus on how you're looking after the resources that you use, those dependencies. Focus on the links between capital and strategy. Look at the long and the medium and the short term. If you're, not, if you're out of business in the short term, you don't need to worry about the long term, you're out of business. But you do need to look at the long term as well. You need to have a planning horizon which runs out past next week, past next year, past the next three years. You need to look at materiality. You need to keep things concise because otherwise you produce an unusable report. And I think we can switch on to the last slide here. If you're looking at it from an investment manager's perspective, you will find that there are no end of studies saying that ESG is important, that assorted natural capital and um, social capital governance are key to producing a, a response in business. If you look at it more carefully, and I rather like this report, um, I'm not sure if you can read the slide there, but it's um, Khan and Yoon and, um, oh, sorry, I can't read it at this size, but um, it, it's a, a quite a useful study which looked at what areas of, um, uh, of ESG reporting companies have, re have responded in. And they discovered that if you pick areas of high materiality, and they use FASB's framework, I think, to decide what areas were high materiality, you've got a much higher performance from companies that looked, well, over, overall, you've got a higher performance from companies that did better on ESG. But more than that, you've got a higher performance from companies that looked carefully at the areas of ESG that they were working on, that they were reporting on, that they were contributing to. And actually, concentrating on those produced a better report, better response, than concentrating across the board and doing everything well. So, high performance on material issues produced a more positive response than a high performance on immaterial issues. That shouldn't be an enormous surprise, but it will give you an idea of why fund managers looking at fundamentals for individual companies will look at that particularly and will look at what are material areas for companies and will be slightly less inclined to look at across the board utterly standardised reporting. You need to focus on the areas that are important to the company. Um, now, that may produce a few problems for Jill's area looking at species extinction because particular species may not be relevant at the, the group level. Um, you want to look at product, you want to look at subsidiary levels, you want to look at regional allocation. There is a push to more reporting at that sort of level. Um, in the UK, we've just delivered a piece of legislation which requires companies to report at subsidiary level on their effects on customers, employees, the environment, other factors. Um, and, and to look at that lower down the corporate tree. I think that sort of legislation will turn up in other countries as well. There's an element of it in King 4 in South Africa. There are elements of it, I'm sure, in, well, there, there are in French legislation. There will be in other countries' legislation. So looking there at um, the, what's material at local levels and what the impact of particular products are is important to deliver into Jill's agenda but is not necessarily important at a group level, so don't put that in your group accounting level because people will look at it and think that's a tiny, tiny part of the group. People won't notice it. I think, given the time scale, I need to hand on to Gemma. Great. Now, hi, everyone.
everyone. I'm Gemma Jones, um, Head of Environmental Issues at the PRI. Um, PRI has over 2,000 global institutional investor signatories who sign up to six principles for responsible investment, which is around integrating environmental and social governance issues into their long-term investment decision-making processes. Um, I wanted to bring your attention to principle two, which is specifically around active ownership. So it's the engagement piece that I'm going to focus on today. Um, and in particular engagement with um, engagement on natural capital. Um, okay. So um, the slide in front of you shows um, a, a diagram from a study which we conducted um, around the value creation from engagement. So we're talking about the benefits of engagement here. Um, and we wanted to show that successful engagement is not just about um, a correlation with positive returns on assets, but it's also about um, encouraging a company to, um, no, sorry, I'm going to go back a step. It's not about just a positive return on assets, but it's also about the communication, the learning, and the internal relationships. And that, that internal relationships um, part is um, shown as political dynamics on the slide to you. Um, it is an opportunity to influence companies at the portfolio um, in your portfolio as well, um, and investors can encourage companies to minimise their negative impact um, and also risk, but also to um, take on those opportunities and to look for um, to maximise their positive contributions as well. So engagement is a great way to raise corporate awareness around E and S issues encourage them to take um, effective actions and then to report back on what they've actually been doing. So at PRI, um, the framework that we use is called um, collaborative engagement. So by collaborative engagement, I mean bringing together a group of um, investor signatories and engaging with um, a target list of companies on a specific E, S or G issue. Um, we have typically focused on listed equity um, listed equity in the past, but that doesn't mean that we have to do that for the future. There are new opportunities coming, I'm sure. Um, we tend to go through um, an educational phase um, with our engagement. So once we have the recruited the group of investors who are going to work together, um, we bring in different um, technical experts and scientists and companies, NGOs, to tell us more about the topic and the issue that we have been, we're trying to learn about. What does it mean? Where is it material? Um, and what does the full landscape mean? And all of this research is then going to inform the development of an evaluation framework which we then use to assess the company's performance and also the progress that that company is making within that engagement period. Um, in terms of the engagement framework, um, it follows a sort of a rough framework of being um, looking at the governance of the company's approach to the issue and what kind of policies and strategies do they have in place and how are they implementing those policies and strategies and also whether the company is actually disclosing and being transparent about what they are doing. Um, we then agree um, the objectives that um, this engagement will um, take forward with, with the investors for the company. Um, and the great thing about collaborative engagement is that um, we have one aligned investor voice. So you have a group of investors asking the company for the same thing, not multiple investors asking the company for multiple things, which is confusing for the company. So, um, just to give you a few examples of what collaborative engagement looks like, um, the first one I wanted to share with you is on our engagement on water risk in agricultural supply chains. So we're currently engaging with 17 global food, beverage, apparel and retail um, companies on how they're managing their water risk in their ag supply chain. Um, we, had this, we started this because we had an investors who were really concerned about companies who are dependent and reliant on agricultural crops and inputs that are high water stress and also grown in high water risk areas, creating potential supply chain disruption. The next engagement I'd like to bring your attention to is um, palm oil. So this is the longest running engagement for PRI. Um, it's focused on Southeast Asia um, and the investors in this group were looking to promote um, a sustainable palm oil industry. Um, there's been a bit of an evolution in this engagement where it's gone through multiple stages. So we started engaging with the key buyers of palm oil from this region. And what we found was that there was not enough certified products on the market. So we decided to engage with the growers, processors and traders. And we made a lot of progress with them. We found that a number of them were now um, putting in policies around um, no deforestation, peat and exploitation. However, there is still a leakage in the market. So we had an unsustainable 
palm oil market still um, existing. Um, and what we found is that um, some of the banks are actually financing this market. So it makes sense to start engaging some of the ASEAN banks. And so we're currently engaging with 10 of those banks today. Um, the next engagement, um, which we've lumbered into one on the slide, um, it's around cattle and soy, so focusing on um, Latin America. And Paul already mentioned that um, the Sahara region is a huge um, producer of soy and, um, and cattle as well. Um, and we are then now engaging with 25 companies across various sectors. So they're looking at consumer goods companies, food sector, retail, traders and producers with the aim to drive awareness amongst these companies around deforestation risk, improve their transparency and also quality of disclosure as well. And finally, just to finish up, which you two would be glad with time, um, just two challenges that I wanted to highlight that we have seen across all of the engagements that I've mentioned. Um, the first one is around um, supply chain traceability and the fact that um, many of the companies we engage with find it difficult to obtain data beyond tier one and two. And therefore, the company doesn't have full supply chain traceability. There is a blockage in the system, and often they're sourcing from aggregators and traders um, who do also do not know who their suppliers are, or they regularly um, exchange their suppliers. Ah, and the second um, challenge is around the fact that having, as we have engaged with listed equity companies, we're engaging with these large multinational companies at the corporate level, but these issues play out at the local level and they're very contextual and regional. Therefore, we need to think about the context, the nuances around commodities and sectors um, when we are doing these engagements. Um, however, we also companies don't always have that asset level data to provide back to the investors. So that has been um, another challenge there. And I am going to stop then pass back to Martina for the discussion. Hi there. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for this very interesting and insightful debate into species extinction and ultimately the natural capital crisis. I, we had a couple of questions from the audience, and I just would like to highlight one of them in the moment. Actually, we had discussed, obviously, the issues here at large. But uh, one of the uh, members of the audience was asking us, and I'm handing this over maybe to Andrew, if he could provide a specific example, or maybe two, on how his organization is trying to manage the organization impact on delaying species extinction slash loss, or maybe other natural capital issues. So Olam started working with one of the frameworks um, that we're talking about here a while back. They've now got through to eight or nine different approaches to this. This has really had a big impact. I was talking to their financial director and to um, their head of sustainability the other day um, about how this is being embedded in their organization. Down to recently they got a concession in Africa to do some uh, agricultural work there. And because they went in there with a very positive attitude that wasn't enforced upon them, that they brought into the concession land, they've completely changed the way that they're doing some of the agricultural work there. It's having an impact on the ground now. Now, every company has difficulties. They think they have challenges with what they're doing. But we're seeing more and more of them building it in to the business model, which is what you've been talking about. So it's not something you do in addition to what you do every day. It's something which has to be at the heart, which I think everyone here is spoken about and Olam is a great example. We've got hundreds of other case studies on our website of companies, financial institutions, governments. We put out 50 case studies last year from governments that are doing this actually on the ground activities that are having an impact. So there's an awful lot of examples out there. Fantastic. Maybe another question here. By investing in natural capital, not all the value of that investment will flow back to the entity that made the investment. Um, how do investors then, in natural capital, get more to fully capture the value or returns on their investments? Shall I pick that one up then, yeah. since Mark <laughs> saved me last time? <laughs> <laughs> When you invest, you never get all of the value the investment generates back because otherwise it wouldn't be providing a service to anyone else. So you invest to create a goods or service, you employ people who get a benefit from being employed by you, hopefully learn from being employed by you, you develop intellectual capital which sits within your workforce and may be released earlier or may go on to other companies. Um, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't tie every, every part of every value that you invest in to, to you. 
but you hope you get back more than you put in. So the aim would be to get, some, get enough back to keep financing your business or to build some other form of capital which goes on, which stays within the business and which allows you to maintain and grow that business. I think there's lots of studies as well that show that investing in communities has payback for those businesses. So, I mean, there's lots of examples that this is a system. Yeah. You know, you can't just expect to have a linear approach that you invest in one thing and get 100% return on it. We know that all of these things come back in many different ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we just take it from the investor portfolio mm -hmm. standpoint, a lot of the investors are universal owners. So they might get the value back through an indirect way, but not through the entity that they're thinking. So mm -hmm. if you have multiple companies in your portfolio, they're all operating, say, potentially with suppliers in the same catchment um, and something happens in that catchment, they're impacting each other, it works its way back up the supply chain and impacts you in a completely indirect way but you haven't quite realised it. Mm -hmm. And someone actually made another interesting point here and said, do we actually need to change the bonus or generally the incentive systems in order to ensure that executives and board members are thinking about new ways of returns on equity here in order to prompt this change? So they were asking what needs to change, and have we got examples potentially where we've already seen that change happening, and is that maybe something that's, that has to sort of still happen in, in order to just, again, change the incentive systems, look at the way we're actually reporting also from a longer term perspective, and ultimately looking at the changes when it comes to rating agencies and their reviews. So quite multiple questions and layers of questions here. Oh, well, just start by saying we are starting to see a shift in executive pay being linked to uh, performance on ENS issues more broadly. We are starting to see that, and that's also part of what the TCFD is asking: put this at governance level, put it at the CEO, and and, and make it happen. Um, so that I think we need to see more of it. But it is, it, you know, it's definitely started to shift from um, a few here and there to be more more mainstream. I'm sure you're seeing that yep. you know, through your your investments as well. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, we've seen examples of, of things like um, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction being included in, in, um, the, in REM schemes, sorry, remuneration schemes. Um, uh, and, and, well, lots of customer related things, for instance. The, the problem is getting something that's robustly measurable, that has credibility with investors, because otherwise the investors are inclined to think that you can mess with it at will. But things like um, airlines, which look for on-time flight departures, for instance, it's customer service, it, it contributes to you being able to retain customers in the future. There are environmental measures, there are social measures there as well. There are not so many of them, more of them are financial because of that credibility, because of that robustness issue. But there will be more. One question that popped in from the audience before we move to our final thoughts and actionable ideas um, this was when Paul was speaking, it came through, is any thought being given to population growth? Is this a, a question you get a lot? <laughs> um, I think the, the, the key question, I, I, or the key th aspect to think about is, is around consumption. Um, and I mentioned uh, in terms of the cause of biodiversity decline, the species extinction crisis, is our consumption, it's the supply chains around that, and it's the materials that we use, how we extract them, how we manufacture them. Um, so I, I wouldn't frame it around population per se. Um, I would say that the plant's not going to be able to cope with uh, 7 million plus people living like me. Um, it's a question of consumption rather than population. Maybe final reflections then back to Mark and Jill. Um, you opened the discussion on what needs to happen now in order to prevent, maybe at least mitigate, the species extinction natural capital crisis? Shall I go first and then you can finish, Jill? So uh, from my perspective, I think that we actually have, we've heard a lot about frameworks today, we know how to do this. There is actually money in the system to do it as well. So it's not about the finances, it's not about having the money, it's not about finding the technologies or the ways to do this. It's actually about the will, is what we're missing. So the next step must be that we as a community that are doing this, and there is a growing community, as Marty was saying, a wave is coming, get your surfboard, get out there on the wave. It, otherwise you're gonna drown, because it is coming. For those companies that aren't picking up on this, for those financial institutions that aren't picking up on this, they will get washed away. 
it is happening, but if we don't get the will, the political will to change these systems, that's where we're going to miss out. So 2020 is a significant year next year, not just at the international agenda around climate change. We've got the International Union for the Conservation of Nature next big meeting. We've got the Convention on Biological Diversity that will be in China, of all places. So we've got all of these big, big international agreements where we can come together with very clear messages for the policymakers about getting these incentive mechanisms right, getting the will behind the technology and the people. It's also when a lot of businesses come to the end of their strategies and plans. They tend to do them in 10-year programs. 2020 is a big year. We've got an opportunity. We've got about eight months now to really try and ramp this up to so the beginning of next year, we can really kick off with some very clear asks, some clear next steps. We've proven we've got the pilots. We know we can do this. We know we can include nature in our discussions. What we've now got to do is get that so it becomes the new normal. Okay. Um, just to finish then, um, thank you for everybody who's come to listen today and uh, ask questions. I, um, I suppose really this is a matter of corporate governance, actually. I think that if we can recognise species uh, loss as a risk within the corporate governance model, then the whole of the governance system needs to address it, whether it's through accounting, whether it's through financial analysis, which we've talked about today. This is an issue for analysts looking at companies and other organisations through the responsible investment chain, through responsible banking, through sustainable insurance, through rating agencies. Every tiny part of the financial system globally can incorporate these issues as we said just now, um, all the frameworks are there, the mechanisms are there, they just need tinkering with and they need to have this particular issue raised into the centre of every single one of them if we're going to avert the type of crisis which is going to be wholly and totally um, destructive, not just to all the other species but to us as well, because we have to remember that humans are a species. We aren't separate from nature, we are part of nature and we need to recognise that within all of our governance and financial frameworks. Fantastic. Thank you, Jill, Mark, the panel here, um, including Paul, Andrew, Gemma, and Mardi. Thank you also, Ryan Ross, again, for hosting this discussion today. All of what's been discussed, the recording obviously is now available on the Bright Hawk website. There's also the concept paper on the Species Extinction Accounting Framework that Jill was alluding to during the day. Further materials will be uploaded and available in due course. We hope you can join us again for the next session on the 27th of June. We are looking at ESG meeting alternatives, building and financing sustainable and smart cities. And thank you very much for your contributions as well for listening in today. Speak very soon. Goodbye.